were there any other questions from the audience um, with regard to specific talks or the synthesis across the talks? Um, the sperm whales, the beak whales, and riso dolphin, the models do not seem to be picking up really what uh, the proxies, the variables we have are not good proxies for what really matters. And I, I strongly suspect it has exactly to do with what Tony was pointing out, that they're really responding to things that are deeper in the ocean than we have good long-term measurements for. Yeah, I just wondered generally, we didn't hear much about split. And first of all, I want to thank you. I learned so much. I mean, we've been meaning to do this in this forum for some time, and it was great. What can you tell me about squid? I mean, in addition to you know what you were talking about before, I just oh, and I'll and I'll and I'll give a little bit of background. That I heard a talk that was given by one of the UBC crowd. They basically said there won't be any market squid in Southern California by within 30 years. And I've always been curious, is that true? Because that would make a pretty big difference. And so I'm just interested in, in that side of things. We, from Cal Coffee, um, they're, they're removing the, 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 the paralarvae now routinely from those Lolo's Cal Coffee surveys. And so I just published last year, in, it's in the Cal Coffee reports that just came out, um, a, a, a basically a, a time series based on the on that paralarval abundance. And so that goes back, I think, to 1981. Basically, they're, they're, the squid paralarvae are really abundant in the, the manta toes, the, the, the new squid toes, and that's when those toes started. And what we, we see really clear relationships with uh, with climate. So that, I mean, and it's similar to what we've known about most of squid, that when there's an El Nino, they really crash, and, you know, the, the, the commercial fishery crashes, and this, the paralarval abundance just disappears. And, and, uh, and, but I, what's nice about it is, is that it is a fishery intended time series, and it is the first we have now for them. And um, it uh, doesn't always correspond to the, to the catches. I mean, there's some indications that, that the paralarval abundance, it takes a bit longer for them to recover from, say, a, a major El Nino than, than, um, than the commercial fishery. But, but in any case, that, that, that time series is now available. I, I mean, into, that's the only squid species for which there is a, a time series. But what about the future? What about the future? Well, it's the, the they seem to, they, you know, they seem to be, um, they don't do well during El Ninos and, and during warm events. And so, right, if, if there is a question in, you know, in the future, and if things get much warmer, um, then they, they probably will be affected. But I'm not sure what the UBC prediction is based on, whether it's warming or, or commercial fishing or what it's based on. No, it, it was strictly predicting patterns of species shifting according to changes in sea surface temperatures. And basically, they said the expected temperature in Southern California Bight is not going to be the habitat for market split. You know, the, I, I, I think it would be really interesting to look more carefully at, at predicted temperatures in the, in the California current, because the California current, it, it isn't simply responding to global warming. I mean, it's, it's obviously so much affected by, by upwelling events and, 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 and so on, and, and transport. So that, you know, the global maps of, of, uh, of sea surface temperature, the, 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 um, if there is a prediction that, that wind driven upwelling may actually increase um, with global warming, and there isn't as close a correspondence, although you know, Mark only shows the, uh, there has been a secular trend, it, it isn't as, as clear in the, in the, in the California current as it elsewhere in the global ocean as the sort of secular increase. So I think it's, it's something that, that needs more than simply saying, okay, you know, global temperature is going to increase by you know, x degrees, and that means that everything's going to shift in the California current. I mean, I think you need 
need to look more closely at this model. Can I just chime in for a second? I think there's, there's three things. One is that squid is a uh, squeeze. The market squid is a species that has a lifetime of about a year, and so it's very um, uh, responsive to environmental variability on that scale. Uh, the second thing is that um, there's um, often a, a lack of consideration of the natural variability in stocks such as anchovy, sardine, and others. And, uh, um, and, and for instance, people talk about sustainability of those stocks, but one has to take into account what the sustainability really means for a stock that fluctuates on a scale of 50 to 70 years. And the third is that uh, climate change, as one looks forward, um, may uh, have us modeling the world operating under different rules, not really rules, but, but things aren't going to be as they have been in the past. And so that one example of this is that upwelling in the California current, um, one generally predicts the amount of nitrate coming up based upon the temperature of the water, nitrate versus temperature relationship. But it's been shown, for instance, that that water that's upwelled is actually subducted in the Northwest Pacific, and the conditions there change also, and so the water that's upwelled is going to be more enriched in nitrogen uh, than it has in the past, and so that we can't use that relationship that we've had for the past 50 years of nitrate versus temperature to predict what will be coming up in the future. So um, there's things I think that we simply don't know about yet, but, it, but we have to look in large scales to be able to appreciate these variations, and um, you know, basin scales, global scales, and uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah. um, I'd like to, to follow up on what Dave just said, not in relation to squid, but, um, but more generally. This issue of whether there are thresholds in the system if, where we might cross the, into a domain that, where we haven't been before. Now let's take the case of, of what I consider is three of the dominant scales of forcing in the system, the interannual, the multi-decadal, and the secular trend. Well, we can look backward in time over the last six decades and get some idea of how we think uh, El Nino events affect the system. Turns out that they're quite different one to another. 2009-10 was a mild event that propagated mainly through the atmosphere rather than mainly through the ocean. And we have to appreciate that sort of thing. But, but let's just say for the sake of argument, we, we think we can understand some of the mechanisms through which El Nino affects the system, um, the ENSO cycle more generally. And we think that, that we can get a bead on some of the, uh, the effects of, let's say, the, the PDO, both through the uh, contemporary studies and also using paleoceanographic techniques and, and uh, analogous techniques on land, with tree limbs and so on, and, and think that we understand uh, PDO. But then we have this warming trend superimposed on that. And we can enter the realm of what I call the triple positive where we have never been before. Now in the past, we may have had a double positive. We may have had a positive state of, the, of ENSO with a positive state of the PDO. Or, um, or we could have a double negative um, as well. A, negative, a, a strong La Nina in the cool phase of the PDO. And so we can start to see how those two terms interact. But when we add that warming trend and we um, what we don't know is when we get out into the future uh, in a warmer background state of the ocean with higher vertical stratification, whether the effects of El Nino in the future or El Nino plus positive states, state of PDO in the future will be comparable to what we've seen in the past. And that's what really worries me. I, there, out there somewhere, there is a threshold um, where we'll enter a new realm. And, um, I have no idea where it is, but it's, it's clear that it, it's there. Yeah, John. Yeah, it's really interesting to me. I think all, all of you did a great job of separating these complicated patterns that occur annually and decadally or multi-decadally from uh, climate change. But it, it seems to me that scientists are often under enormous pressure to uh, interpret things in the climate change context and there are examples I see in the literature where someone will take I've seen as little as a three-year pattern explained in terms of climate change which makes no sense on the time context you guys have shown but I was just wondering if each of you could contact you know comment within your field 
of how do you deal with that interplay, this politically charged you know, media need to try to interpret things in the context of climate change from the far more complex reality of the more scientific way all of you look at it. But I mean, there's, there's a tension and a dynamic there that uh, I'm just curious how you guys deal with. I, 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 I constantly face those questions related to explaining changes in blue whales or other things. And, I, I think that is an excellent point, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think that um, there are many times when, in the scientific community, people overinterpret short records, short temporal records. Uh, I, I review manuscripts where people, uh, oh, the climate change is a context for almost everything today, and people, people submit grant proposals pur purporting to represent the effects of a changing ocean climate on X, Y, Z, um, when it's really a misnomer. Uh, I, I think we have to retrench and look at, first of all, to differentiate ocean weather from ocean climate, and really be honest about when we're able to resolve these signals and when we're not. Uh, I think we're quite fortunate in this part of the ocean that with the Cal Coffee record, we have a 60-year context. That's not enough, but it's more than exists in most other parts of the ocean. And we really have to look not at just what's happened in dissolved oxygen in the last 10 or 15 years, what's happened in the last 60 years. We need the context. To just to am amplify on that, um, there was an, an interesting series of papers on the on the oxygen content in the deep water in in, uh, in the California current. I mean, in, in 2008, Steve Bolger had put out a, a very nice paper, but he he chose to start looking at the rec Cal Coffee record in 1984 because of the, the sampling he thought was more consistent then, and he basically he only caught this downward slope and and interpreted it entirely as, as as climate change. And then uh, the, there's a, two years later, a paper came out with Sam McClatchy and others, where he basically took a record back to 1950 to the, in the Cal Coffee record. And then you see this, this uh, dome-shaped relationship. And it's really unclear now what, what is happening. I mean, there have been now been, been uh, sort of, I mean, there have been studies based on 20, approximately 20 year records all around the North Pacific and in the tropical oceans that are all showing this decline. And so it is commonly often being inferred that this is, this is due to climate change. And certainly, that is what the global climate models predict. But uh, there, there could well, it, it's clear that there could well be, you know, decadal scale, this decadal scale variability in here as well. I mean, quite, it's, it's, we're not, we don't understand why in the 50s the uh, oxygen content in the, in the California current seemed to have been quite low. And, and uh, you know, it's just not, it's just not entirely clear. Um, th there was recently a paper in Science that sort of looked, trying to, to look at that and looking at changes, it, it basically, uh, ascribing it to changes in mixed layer depth and, and, and respiration, and tying it in also with nutrient availability and denitrification. So it's it's uh, but the um, the changes due to cli to global climate change are often you know they're relatively they're um, they're often much uh, slower than the changes that need this decadal scale variability or the El Nino scale variability, and so it is it is hard to it is hard to parse these things out. Yeah, and I guess I'll add to you, I, I, John, I think that is an excellent question and, and a conundrum. And, and even though I feel very data rich now that we have these six California current wide marine mammal surveys with a lot of oceanographic data, I would be very hesitant to say that they're really going to tell me what will happen 100 years from now because I do expect that those relationships, you know, we are using proxies and those proxy relationships are likely to change through time just as they're different in different ecosystems. The, the proxies are different. We're seeing a different part of that relationship, whether we're in the Eastern Tropical Pacific or the California Current or in the Central Pacific, as, as we learn more through these models. Um, so I think, you know, my answer would be that we can use this to help guide us in terms of defining a realm of possibilities. But I think if I were ever to publish things, I would always end it with a question mark, you know, and sort of say this is not necessarily what will happen, but this is based on what we've seen in the past, what might happen. And, and I would expect to see some of those state shifts or, or changes in proxy relationships that would be, you know, jumps, as you say, that changes those relationships. Yes, Mike, I'll, I'll just try and briefly, my, my comment would be that it's a bit like using weather observations to infer about climate, and, and so I agree with everything that's been said, but I'd also add that um, it's 
like the physical basis for the climate change that the IPCC publishes. It's the understanding that uh, we need to acquire to be able to uh, interpret the events we observe and predict into the future, and, and that's what the young people in this room are hopefully going to be doing. And, uh, and, and when I think about climate change and think about the future, I think about my kids, I don't know what to think. Um, but I do know that adding CO2 to the atmosphere, methane to the atmosphere, is going to cause a physical warming. And that that will have consequences of unknown sorts right now, but there will be consequences. And so I think if we can provide an understanding that um, it's very much more difficult in biology, of course, that, that, that that's uh, an important way to, 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 to proceed, you might say. And I think all the studies we do are, you know, are, are you know, collectively trying to ascertain that understanding. And, uh, so, uh, but the observing part is very difficult. <laughs> Building up a little bit on that, I wanted to say that uh, Calcalfi has uh, basically set the gold standard for long-term time series and how do you analyze and tease out signals and, and so on. And um, as a marine mammal community um, that are here in this room gather, I think it's important to also recognize, as John was saying, the fact that the, uh, the records are so short and um, we're just starting to build enough data sets uh, on marine mammals, but uh, they're five, six, ten years old, 50. That's still too short to try and apply the same uh, time series analysis techniques, and that's a danger because uh, people are tempted to follow the same gold standard, and if that if does not work, and from an ecological point of view as well, um, we're looking at planktonic organisms, organisms that res respond very readily to climate variability, whereas uh, top predators integrate over out of those scales. So not necessarily is a good idea to um, try to replicate those things, but try to identify what are those signals that really could have an impact on the top predatory ecology. Is it um, also given our current emphasis that the current administration has given on ecosystem-based management and um, the fact that just the simple thing that's getting out to the general public of well, the, the world's getting warmer really isn't uh, necessarily correct characterization. Should we try to reframe some of these questions, especially to take some of the things that you guys have brought up today that make me uh, quite a bit more concerned with the idea that what changes will we see if dissolved oxygen is in a state of, of decline right now? Because uh, for each of you, the resources you all described, there's going to be an effect and something's going to change. And then it will eventually change something at the level of what Karen was talking about. Or if we are looking at acidification in the ocean, those are kind of the things that we could say during this period, this is happening, and we need to manage resources in that context because those are things we can actually measure and possibly have a sense of what might occur on the scales of change that we know about with that. So is that a, a reframing of those questions or making it a little more complex for the general world, but also taking it away from this broad, unattainable, or, or un, unassailable sort of idea of it's changing uh, to something that's a, a lot more uh, we can wrap our minds around. Is that what the kind of change we need to make with the, the public? Uh, changing public opinion is completely beyond me. <laughs> um, I think I'll leave it at that, actually. <laughs> the, I'm not actually so convinced that the, that the general public has accepted um, the, the, the notion that our environment, that there have been human-induced perturbations to the atmosphere, ocean, and living marine resources in the ocean. That's not ubiquitous. Um, we, in our LTR site, we have a resource economist who is a, a participant. And he can, I don't know if uh, Mr. Lorton is still present in the audience. Um, in any case, um, he could probably speak to this, but, uh, but, but the resource economist, Zhang Zhang Zhi Zhang, uh, conducted an interview with uh, party boat captain operators in San Diego. And he was able to interview, he and his team were able to interview, I think, about 70 of 
90 or 95. I mean, a fairly substantial part of the total population, although it's a, it's, you know, a small number of individuals. And um, his, his basic theme, what he wanted to understand was their perception of how um, resources that they depend on, that depend on, were changing um, as the environment changed. And he, the first question, though, was what um, proportion of the, the respondents thought that climate change was a possibility? And the result was absolutely disarming. 12.9% of the people who responded to the survey thought that, um, that global scale climate change was a possibility. Now, this does not correspond to the general perception in the United States. The recent surveys in the last year and the year before suggest it's probably something closer to 70 to 74 percent of the general public does. But here is a group whose livelihood depends on understanding the time variability of the system, and they're much savvier than we are. And they're, um, many, many of their perception is that the environment is is not changing in a progressive way, that there are cycles. That's the common response, that there are El Nino, La Nina cycles. Well, part of my point was that, yes, there are quasi-cycles related to El Nino, La Nina, and, but that can mask some of these other very important changes that are occurring concurrently. So, my, um, so I think we have a, an educational step to, to accomplish um, even with people whose livelihood depends immediately on the ocean. Just to kick in with that, I mean, what are the complicated things about the California current, and particularly going back to kind of the school question, is that you, know, you think about, in, for example, with the SST, you might have upwelling waters, will actually provide kind of a cooling buffer. But then this idea, again, of the low oxygen, if you're going to have that effect and increase and, you know, the shallow shoaling of the OMs in the they being able to deal with those kind of uh, interaction effects, I think, is way beyond where we are now and where we, I think, as a community need to go. Because those are just two of the 15, 20, 50, whatever, you know, number of kind of ecosystem changes. And that's kind of the, the interdisciplinary approach and the collaborations that are necessary, I think, that they're starting to be built. But that's fundamentally where a lot of us need to go, in my opinion. Yeah, and I, I, can I just add on that? I, I think that there is some room to you know, for effect within the public. Because most people, you know, you can go to the desert, you can have summer, winter, we know about temperature changes. It's like, what's the big deal? But I think if you start telling people that all the shelled organisms are gonna start dissolving, or that the oxygen is going away, we get the oxygen dead zones, those seem to have a little bit more attention-grabbing power. And perhaps translating the effects as we learn more into things that, that I think are, are a little bit more you know, that just feel bad, you know, to the, to the public, in, in a sense, might help with that. Um, but, you know, obviously we have a long way to go in terms of understanding those relationships, but I think there are some <coughs> that made some progress on, in raising awareness. I'm just going to say that, you know, it, they, the, it, the history of, of our understand, the scientific understanding of these changes, it's been very rapidly evolving. I mean, okay, you know, it's been, between 50 and 100 years, for the people have understood that adding carbon dioxide is going to lead to global warming. And it probably got established, you know, in the, in the 50s with people like Ravel, Roger Ravel and, and Sue sort of showing that that's probably going to happen and starting to set up the, the, the monitoring system. But our understanding that, that uh, of, of acidification and more recently even of, of, um, of deoxygenation of deep water it's really in the last 10, 15 years. And, and so, these, these, I mean, even as scientists, we haven't appreciated the, the, uh, these, these factors. And so, um, so yeah, we do need to, to educate the public, but there's a, it's also a really rapidly evolving science. And, and we, we really don't understand how it's all going to, how it's, these are going to work with each other. Yeah, one of the most dramatic changes in marine mammal, um, uh, marine mammal uh, uh, distribution and, and density for the last couple of decades has been the sharp and tidal whale. They were very common in the Southern California Bight, um, and then it, after the 83, 84, 84 El Nino, they basically just disappeared. And there's, I don't believe there's any evidence that the population crashed or anything like that. Um, so it seems like they must have gone somewhere. 
do any of you have any insights from your work on where they may have gone and whether they might come back? <laughs> um, I have a hypothesis that there unfortunately are no data to support, but there were two things going on, um, well, very little data to support, but there were two things going on during that period of the 70s and early 80s. One was the, the strong El Nino that was generally blamed for the disappearance of the pilot whales, but there was also evidence of a rather substantial fishery-related mortality that was taking place in the squid fishery, that they would, um, were actually actively killing animals. And this resident population was a fairly small population on the order of hundreds of animals. And there were some old um, administrative reports that did back of the envelope calculations that you know have statistical confidence limits that make us all cringe. But the point estimate was around 30 animals per year. And so I think likely, given that those animals have never been seen again, they've never been associated with any other island groups, any other similar type of habitat, the squid that they fed on have come back with a vengeance to some extent. I think it's very likely that that was a combination of anthropogenic mortality and, and uh, this climate variation of the ENSO of 82 that, that combined to basically eliminate that population. But that's a theory. I can't. We don't have information to really confirm that, other than that it never come back. So, Given this you know, background that we're sort of low on the learning curve, we know that things are going to change. We anticipate that there's going to be some, in the not too distant future, move into the triple positive unknown realm, the realm of the unknown. What do you panelists see as ways that we should change the way we do business as scientists? to allow us to provide the best scientific advice to these things that we aren't really able to anticipate from a conservation standpoint. Do we just continue to do business the same way we have in the past, or is there something that we can do to improve our efficacy as scientists? I'd say communication is is the key, and uh, and I uh, I think the particular importance is educating students in primary and secondary sec secondary school, high schools, junior highs, um, as well as offering good courses in, at the college level. Ironically, at the University of California, San Diego, where we teach, uh, there's not a course in sustainability, um, and so that if which I think actually students would flock to if it was made available due to politics within the university. Nobody's willing to yield the turf to let somebody else teach it. So, um, uh, so I think in addition to continuing research, being able to communicate the results of that research to allow people to make decisions. I mean, basically that's what we need to do is allow people to make informed decisions. And that involves electing people that we think will act responsibly as, as well as uh, being able to go to Safeway or Bonds and, and select the seafood that we think is sustainable. And uh, I can do no, neither of those two things right now very easily. Um, I, I don't know what's, I, I have an idea what's sustainable, but, but I guess basically what I'm saying is that I think that information and knowledge is really important, communicating that particularly to children who are going to be coming up to be uh, voters and, and citizens in a full way um, is, is key. So. Um, and we're behind. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, coming back to again, Cal Coffee is the gold standard. And to me, I, I think ultimately you're, it's going to take a multi pronged approach. And I think that the people who have expertise doing what they're doing and are doing a great job have to continue doing it. But there has to be a level of integration that does occur from you know, across traffic levels and across disciplines to really be able to understand, you know, share ideas and you know, maybe you know, just sitting over the cooler, you might say, oh, we you know, we saw this change and. Someone else might be able to see a similar one, and that that kind of collaboration, I think, can you know, just extend the value of the science. And the second side of that, I would add that a prong of modeling, I mean, similar to what Karen's doing, is also going to be critical. Is because as computers get more and more, <laughs> you know, technology is always going to get better. We can get a better idea, maybe even more of the mechanisms, and be able to predict and test these predictions to get a better idea on how the ecosystems are interacting. It'll just be ideas. 
<laughs> Isn't the lesson of Cal Coffee though is that you really need to establish a baseline and, and stick with it? I mean, it, there's almost no one left now who was involved in Cal Coffee in 1949, right? There probably isn't, right? And it's sort of passing the baton forward to the next generation because you know the time scales are longer than any of us are going to be around. So, so I'm partly trying to address what Barbara's saying. You know, as scientists, it's important somehow that we can make our work go forward and you know be useful as a baseline to the next generation. One one thing I'd add here is in, you know in I worked for a number of years in in, in Australia where. Most of the science, most of the science funding, was basically through a central organization, the CSIRO, and uh, and and so there there was naturally a greater tendency towards integrated science. And here in the in the U.S., the, the model is largely of, of private investigators as, as well as it's, you know sort of government agencies. But I think it's important that we that we have uh, as have a, as a as a intellectual kind of context that, that we think that, that, that we need to have several prongs and that all those prongs need to go forward at the same time. So, I mean, obviously as, as Cal Coffee director, I, I believe yeah, you know, having a baseline, having continuing the observation the time series, that's absolutely critical. But along with that, I think what we, what's needed is a combination of, of, of process studies, and I think Dave Checkley just alluded to that. We have to be trying to figure out the mechanisms that. Have, Acidification or, or lower in, decrease oxygen or temperature change. You know, laboratory field studies that look at the processes and then combining that with modeling. And I think that you really have this like three legs of a stool. There's modeling, the, the observation time series, and the, and the kind of the process mechanistic kind of studies that basically have to com com come together really and, and that we have to, as a community, be conscious that we have to, you know, or we each have our own specialties and our own, uh, our own way of doing things, that there has to be uh, those, we have to keep that three-legged stool uh, standing and, and we can't, you can't knock out one of those legs and still have, expect to, to make some real progress. Let me take a, um, a stab at what to, what to do in the face of the pending triple positive. I think the first, my first point would be that um, change is not necessarily bad. I mean, change that that the ocean environment or that living marine resources or other living populations of our marine resources are changing. That's a neutral statement that doesn't have a value judgment associated with it. And I think uh, the first objective should be to understand um, how and why the, uh, the environment is changing and what consequences it will have. Um, whether there are more Euphasia pacifica or more nictiphany simplex um, is an interesting, why there might be more of one and less of another is an interesting question to me. Um, answering that question doesn't in, imply any value judgment about whether it's better to have Euphasia pacifica or nictiphany simplex. Okay? And I think that um, extends to other organisms as well. And in the ocean acidification context, it's always said there will be winners and losers. It's not clear that, that it's a unidirectional sort of change. There will be um, rearrangements of natural marine communities on some time scale. So um, the changes, change by, the, by itself is not necessarily deleterious. And especially in this dynamic eastern boundary current, most of these organisms have evolutionary histories that, it, uh, that um, have, have exposed them to exceptional levels of variability. And many of the endemics are evolved to this kind of PDO variation, ENSO variation, and so on. Uh, so there, there, there may be a lot of resilience in some of these populations, especially the endemics to the system. From the zooplankton perspective, I worry more about the expatriates that are coming from outside the system than the endemics, because the endemics probably have a, a lot of inherent uh, capability to either genetic or physiological um, to tolerate. So, um, so uh, figure out what's changing. Um, and then there's the question of whether this is uh, in the, the realm, realm of marine mammals, um, whether these are changes that society can tolerate or not tolerate. Now we're getting into the realm of value judgments. 
and uh, also far outside my expertise, but I would say the precautionary principle is one to use um, in, uh, as a paramount guiding principle. That you need to find the at-risk populations, the vaquitas or the others that are close to minimum um, threshold population densities, and uh, intervene first where it's clear that there are societal priorities and that there are some kinds of ecosystem services that these spe specific populations confer that we have a high priority to try to retain. And there may be other populations that will change and we, you know, that's what happens. I've got to stop for a second because you made it kind of, and I don't say gloss over, but you made it kind of like, well, it's going to change, it's okay. And through ocean acidification in there and kind of just kind of like, slid it under and I I don't know that it's that simple oh it's not that simple okay. I, I actually I was I held up I, I, I had a, a comment that I wanted to make to Karen that I sort of wedged in there okay. um, that, that pertained to the OA problem okay. yeah, I, I, just to clarify I had no intent of really making it that simple <laughs> <laughs> we live with complexity yes. yeah. yeah although I just to follow up on what Mark said I think it's a really good point that change is not inherently bad. And I think the challenge for uh, those of us that want to manage um, sustainable marine mammal populations is that that change, though, can alter the dynamic between human effects on those populations, such as fisheries or, you know, a animal risk or risk of getting struck by ships, um, like the blue whales in the Southern California Channel, in the Santa Barbara Channel. And so understanding how those changes will change the distribution of these animals in a way that we will either have a greater or, or a lesser impact on them, that to me is one of the challenges of managing marine mammal populations successfully. And, and we don't have those answers yet. And for some species, we're gaining some insights, but I think we do still also uh, have a long way to go on some of that. How are the results or the knowledge that we gained through Cal Coffee disseminated to the California public and the state and local leaders? How, how is that available to them and how do they consume it? Oh. <laughs> it's a, it's a, okay, it's, it's done in various ways. I mean, some of Cal Coffee is, 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 uh, is worked up by the, by the scientific community. So in other words, the, the management of sar the sardine and, and some of the other fisheries is, is very directly based on the stock assessments that come out of you know, some of the cow coffee sampling. Um, and then there's, there's um, you know, people like myself or other people who use the, the data will end up going to, you know, there's publications, scientific publications going to, to meetings uh, like this and others that, and, and, and communicating the, re the, the results. Um, I should say that you know Cal Coffee runs on a, on a it actually runs on a very lean budget. I mean we have actually no no funds for a communications group. We have uh, uh, so it, it's it's in, in fact we don't actually have any funds to for, for students or postdocs or any you know so in fact it's largely the, the data is there and it's used by the community and and it's it's used fairly fairly widely because it is out there. And it's, it is such a, a great data set, but uh, you know there isn't a there isn't a, a group that you know we don't have a communications group that, that makes glossy booklets and, uh, and and goes out to schools and so on. I mean it's just really through the you know the efforts of myself and other scientists who basically make the efforts to uh, to, to write up results and, and communicate to the public. So it's uh, it's a kind of a, it is a bit of a haphazard process. <coughs> In these lean times, it's it's uh, it, it's really is it's the best I, I think can be done. It's a good question, I think, and um, uh, I mean, Cat Coffee has a really good website, and, and so that you can always go there. Uh, but people don't go to websites just out of the blue. You know, type in Cat Coffee if you're sitting in, day, in Sacramento. So um, so I think there's probably a need to extend out further uh, than we already do. Um, what's made Cal Coffee as successful as it is, is because in, in part, large part, I think it's a, a triumvirate of, of buy-ins, basically, the state, the feds, and, and the academic institutions. 
And uh, I think it's worth noting that, that, that there's been times at which it's almost disappeared because of lack of funds, but, but somebody stepped up to the plate to try and uh, keep it going. Um, right now, Noah is that person. And, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's really very important to emphasize to the state as well as to know back at headquarters in Washington, D.C. or Silver Spring that, that uh, the value of Cal Coffee in terms of not just fisheries but climate change. And so your point's well taken, actually, and probably more people do. <coughs> saying Tony should do more necessarily, but I think getting the word out as part of this communication is, is very important. In addition to what you say with the public's response, when we're going out talking to these people, are we targeting the people that actually care? Because I'm sure there's a <coughs> portion of the country in general. It's you know, landlocked has never seen the ocean. They have no general inherent interest in that. How do we target a group of people that don't even know that they should care about these things? I think that may be the ultimate grassroots spot. It's tough. It's sort of like Jay's comment yesterday about the fishermen in the northern Gulf of California that, that have a probability of once in every 10 years catching a vaquita, yet the vaquita is at risk due to the cumulative effect of those fishers. And it's a di different question, but, but, but how do you convince somebody in Cal Coffee, in, in Kansas, that Cal Coffee is important? You, you don't necessarily have to do that. But um, one of the things, I mean, NOAA has a very successful program called Science in a Sphere that's in the Smithsonian and a variety of other places in which they have a sphere in which they, they, uh, they, they illuminate it with various things that NOAA is doing. Um, and it's very effective, actually, if you go to the Smithsonian, you can see this. So there's ways to get to people, um, um, but there's always a need to get to more people, I think. Start out by telling them, the people in Topeka, that 50% of the oxygen they're breathing is coming from photosynthesis uh, carried out in the ocean. <laughs> One of every two breaths they owe to the ocean. <laughs> I just wanted to add um, a, uh, something that's available for communication and open it up to anybody that would be interested in using us. But we've, um, based on Cal Coffee and the California Current, we've um, worked with artists grateful to develop um, called Lucy's Green Seeds. And it's a series of artworks. And we just are now almost um, complete with text that goes with all of these and an online dynamic way of um, access. And I'd just like to open that up that um, with the science background now completed, we'd like to partner with educators or people that would like to use that to reach the public. And I have really enjoyed uh, working with Tony in the past on science and art as well, right? and make uh, Cal Coffee available. And it tells all sorts of stories, from 40 um, sets of images from many mammals to fisheries to uh, climate change to a variety of things in there. So it's open for ideas. I think this has all been really important. I mean, I think the, the, it would be really valuable to have a, 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 um, uh, a push for Ocean education in, in, the, in the public schools. I mean, as, as Dave Checkley was saying, it's it's it, it, we do have to get to this next generation. And, and uh, you know, young people often have very little idea of what 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 is really happening in the ocean. And, and I think it's also you know there've been some wonderful documentaries. And Blue Planet is wonderful. And you know, lots of wonderful documentaries that show sort of the wonder of the ocean. I think what's needed is is you know either a popular uh, book or documentaries. That, that, that bring out the science, the science of, of some of what we're doing. I mean, the real concern is not just you know wonder, the wonders of the ocean. It's really these kind of difficult questions that, that scientists are facing about what's the you know what's the coming fate of the oceans, and that's uh, and that's very hard to convey. But it, you know, we, we could use a I don't know a Richard Dawkins or a, <laughs> you know, one crazy sort of a thing is that uh, I've mentioned this once or twice in the last week or two is that. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, there's seafood in the seafood place, but you don't know where that seafood's come from, whether it's sustainable or not. Why can't there be an app that you could point your iPhone to ask? No, not that app. Why, why isn't there an app? <laughs> why isn't there an app that you can point at some symbol that's on the labels for each one of those things in that in that thing that will tell you where it came from and whether it's sustainable? You can type in the species, but most of the stuff in there you don't know where it's come from. 
It's mislabeled, too. So why can't we have a regulation in the United States that says that if you're going to sell seafood, just like you sell beef or anything else, you can have the ability to know where it came from, you know, its provenance, basically, and be able to find out whether it's sustainable. Um, and, you know, people, you know, at UBC, especially in college group, they talk about this and they do very good research on it. But it seemed to me that something really effective you could do with it's pretty easy there. Maybe I'm out to lunch, I don't know. But <laughs> I'd love to be able to have something like that from the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> We have time, I saw John at his hand, so we have time for kind of one more question, so I'll let John wrap us up. I, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to throw a little grenade to promote a, a response. And with a security. <laughs> and, and, and I guess, uh, yeah, because I want to get the other side of my question. If we hear it takes, you know, 50 year time scales, it's really complicated, we have uh, all of these other indicators that mask uh, climate change signals, change may not be bad and uh, what would be wrong with saying maybe ocean ecosystems are a lousy place to look for a climate change signal. I'm, not, I'm obviously trying to maybe provoke the other side of that question. <laughs> okay. no, look, I, I don't think they are a lousy place to look because we are we're seeing, you know, when, when, when Cal Coffee started, what's amazing to many of us now is that we didn't even know about El Nino. I mean, when, when, the, when they first had a, the ma first major El Nino in the early years of the Cal Poppy, it was in 57, 58. And there was a symposium, special symposium, because everyone realized something was, had happened that was really strange and unusual. And Warren Wooster stood up and said, you know, there's a, there's a phenomenon off Peru called El Nino, which seems to be similar to what's happening here. Literally, that's what he said. And so we didn't even know 50 years ago that El Nino is a process that affects the, 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 the Pacific Ocean as a, as a, as a base, whole basin. And so we've learned an incredible amount. And, and, and you know, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation wasn't known. And it's, it's basically learned through these climate time series and the NPGO and, and so on. So, you know, it's, it's not as if it's all intractable and, and impossible. If we've really made tremendous progress, and it's important to recognize that. And you know, as I was, you know, the, the fact of ocean acidification, the oxygenation, those are those are things that have just been coming out in the last decade or so. So we're, we're, it's happening very, very quickly. And and my, I, I would I would want to differ with Mark on, on the question of it's all just change. I mean, oh, some some you know. I, that some of the cha all change, all change is not bad. No, all change, all change is not bad. But one of the things that's happening right now is that the change is happening uh, at much more rapidly than it has probably, you know, for, for literally tens, maybe 50 million years. So the last time probably we saw this kind of rapid change was there was a, 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 a there was a major extinction event in the oceans, and it was probably due to massive release of, of methane hydrates and causing a CO2. Uh, you know, huge warming and and, the ox and similar kinds of things that we're seeing now, acidification and so on. And so it's happening very, very quickly, and we we aren't sure where it's going. Um, but it, you know, it clearly could have huge impacts on the ocean. Um, and uh, and the, the fact is that some change, you know, the, the species in the California current are used to change, but they're not they're not used to deoxygenation and and acidification. And so on, on on the time scale that we're, we're we're going to witness it in the next century or so, and so that we we really need to be very, you know, and and as everyone said, we're, we there are tipping points, and we don't know where they where those tipping points are, and we don't know when or if we, we will reach these tipping points. But I mean, one of the things that that's that we've always felt good about is that you know the the uh, you follow the Pacific Ocean. Shows shows its cycles and the Tiffany's does, but they basically have always been basically pretty pretty resilient and come back and, and uh, now you know with acidification and, and so on, we don't know not warming at some point some it will be tipping points. I mean there will have, seem to be tipping points with coral reefs. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'll interrupt here and say you know, let's talk about this more after lunch or Sorry. later in the day and thank everyone. Just really quick out there, the issue of ocean literacy. Um, there is actually, there is a ocean literacy game that's been done through high schools and it's national. NSF is funded an organization called 
COSI, which is um, Centers for Ocean Science and Sections Education. And anybody in the room, any researcher can Google it, and they would love to partner with you guys. So if you're looking for people to connect, um, just C-O-S-E-E, -E, and they, yeah, they'll, they'll get you guys connected. Thanks to all of you, listen, we're heading up to the 10th now.